three. All right, guys, we are we've got a very special show today and a very special guest, one that I've been looking forward to uh, for quite some time. And I know you guys, have, especially uh, since Mr. Mike Buckland, Bucky came on and uh, shared his amazing uh, historical uh, uh dedication to the SOG that he has and also some of his missions that he ran. Uh, and one of the more memorable missions that you guys remember, uh, we've got the pilot that was flying Bucky. Um, so today we have Mr. Frank Doherty and he's going to be here talking to us a little bit about the history of his unit and his history but as well uh, as to promote his upcoming biography, which I will be linking uh, a pre-order link down in the bottom of the show notes so y'all can hop on Amazon and uh, go pre-order that. So without further ado, Mr. Frank, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you very much for having me, bud. I really appreciate it, especially following uh, my friend, Mike Buckland, um, who I, I absolutely loved. And I have, uh, Mike spent a lot of time in the back seat of my airplane. When I was a little boy, my parents took me to the Idlewild, which then became Kennedy. And my dad was going flying and my mother kept the car. And it was the first time that I'd seen an airport. And we went up to the observation deck, which is what you could do. And I watched my father walk out across the ramp to a TWA constellation, a four engine uh propeller driven airplane and my dad was the first officer and I looked down and I thought that's my father a couple of years later when I was in the sixth grade he said do you want to go to work with me and I said yeah and so he took me he was a captain now and we flew out of LaGuardia and we flew that same kind of airplane a Connie to Columbus Ohio and back and uh, we flew over Forbes Field in Pittsburgh and I got to I could see the ballpark but the, and the flight engineer asked me, do you want to listen to the game? And I said, no, the Dodgers were playing the Pirates, Jackie Robinson and Pee Wee Reese. But I told him, I, I don't want to watch that. I want to I want to watch this. This is really fun. So I think that day uh, when we got back, I um, I made up my mind right then and there that this was what I was going to do. And uh, and so I did a, a lot of my contemporaries when they went into the service, they had the, the support of their family. Um, and uh, m mine was a little different. When I got to Vietnam, my parents were very supportive. The interim between uh, signing up as a, in to ROTC at school and uh, actually going off to the Army was awful. My parents were so furious. My dad was a B-24 pilot during World War II. He absolutely hated that I had joined, hated it. My mother slapped me when I told her that I had joined. And so uh, my dad knew what I had done when I came home after my junior year in college and I had an, an Army haircut. The Christmas before that, when I came home, I hadn't had a haircut for probably two years and I had a ponytail. And uh, I was in, giveaway. in college in San Francisco. So I had a ponytail and I had rose colored glasses and I get out of the car at Christmas time and flown all night from, from California. And my dad comes to Kennedy to pick me up and he car goes by and he's looking at me and he doesn't stop and he keeps going. And he went, <laughs> came back around the airport again, gets out of the car. He says, what are you supposed to be? <laughs> and so I put my bags in the back of the car. I went home I had dug myself such an academic hole at uh, at USF that there was no crawling out. So I knew that the that the military was inevitable, and so I decided I was going to get the best deal I could. And I I got that advice from my wife's cousin, who was my family doctor. I hadn't met her yet, but uh, but I knew him, and he said, "Tell you what, boy," he said, "get the best deal you can get." And I said, "Well, I don't want to walk," so I wound up learning how to drive tanks as a tank platoon leader. And I thought, I really don't want to do this either. So I went to flight school. And when I came back that summer after my junior year and I had signed up for ROTC and I had an army haircut, my father this time did stop the car when he first saw me, got out and looked at me and he said, 
can you some kind of fruitcake? And I looked at him and I started laughing, but he knew. And when we got home, I had to explain. And that's that's when the whole world blew up. Oh. And they were barely speaking to me. Um, they would not drive me to ROTC summer camp. My friend had to drive me to the airport to get out to the camp. But um, flight school was, I mean, I, I loved doing it. And uh, I got I got very lucky uh, with some of the instructors. I had a guy named Weaver. I don't even know what his first name was. Never did. He was an Department of the Army civilian. He had slick back hair and a pencil thin mustache. He looked just like Smile and Jack. And he had he had nicotine stains on his flight gloves that were his gloves were bright orange between these two fingers. He chain smoked camels, and we we're flying around <clears throat> Fort Stewart. And about two weeks into being with him, I screwed up the courage to ask him why he spent the entire time we were flying doing this. And I, and I said, Mr. Weaver, what are you looking for? And he said, Messerschmitt's kid, Messerschmitt's. He was a P-38 pilot during World War II over <laughs> Italy. And I thought, oh my God, you know, it's Messerschmitt's and swastikas and here this guy's a, a real hero. And I'm, I'm taking up space in his cockpit. He had these little discs that he would put over all the instruments and he would block them so that I couldn't see them. And he would say to me, how high are we? How fast are we going? Um, what's your pitch attitude? What are you doing? And the whole thing was to fly by your butt. And so you're sitting right over the center of gravity in this, this uh, uh, Cessna uh, 172. And you, you, you sensed it. You listened to it. You felt it. Um, after instrument phase, learning how to fly a Baron, twin-engine Baron, I got, I got very fortunate, and I'm very happy to say that he's here on this broadcast today, my instructor, Ray Carl, from uh, the beginning phase of, uh, of Bird Dogs, and uh, Ray was in the back seat. And I mentioned him in the book because he said something to me, and I, he probably doesn't even remember that he said it, but he said to me that a, a fact is a bullseye with a propeller. And I started laughing, but he was absolutely right. He wasn't lying, even though he was smiling. But it, it was a bullseye with a propeller. And I thought, well, yeah, you're right. It, it, that's what we were. In fact, um, one of my platoon leaders, when I left, I swear he had a bullseye painted on the side of his airplane. His name was John Pappas, a guy I absolutely loved. And when I lived in Seattle, there was a sign up in second deck and left field at Safeco Field with a bullseye and it said, hit it here, Junior, talking about Griffey. And when I saw the sign, I started to laugh and I said, God damn, Pappas, that's, that's what he was doing. Anyway, um, when I left the service, um, I was lucky enough to get on with an airline and I have no idea why they hired me, and um, but they did. And I made a life of it and it was great fun. It was the most fun you could possibly have and get paid. I thought, why should I could do that? You know, you pull up, it goes up, you push down, it goes down. Um, when I first got to Vietnam, I flew for the 18th Aviation Company. So I was driving otters up and down the beach from Da Nang up north towards the DMZ and then down about as far south as Quinion. And I thought, this is the most profoundly boring thing I've ever done in my life. The airplane was great fun to fly. An otter was really a kick. I mean, it was a big tailwheel job that kind of lumbered along, but you could shoot great wheel landings in it. And it was a little tricky in crosswind. So it's like a giant bird dog, but nothing ever happened. I mean, you flew up the coast, you flew down the coast, you went here, you went there, but you were a, a bus. And I thought, I gotta, I gotta do something a little more fun than this. So I went in and told a company commander of the 18th that I wanted out and I hated it. And he looked at me and he said, I don't want anybody in my unit that doesn't want to be here, so pack your stuff. And he makes a phone call to uh, Major Nauman up in, uh, in Pleiku at the 219th. And uh, that afternoon, I was at Camp Holloway. It did, I mean, I went from Quinion, packed my bags up in Da Nang and went right to Holloway. And I uh, got off and Nauman said to me, are you a troublemaker? And I said, I don't, don't want to be. <laughs> no. I interviewed with Don Ship. He was the first one to talk to me. He was the executive officer, and Ship was one of the biggest guys I'd ever seen in my life. He 
filled up a room. He was a offensive tackle for the University of Texas at Arlington. And a uh, lovely guy. I mean, I love Don, but he was just a, he's just a giant. I have no idea how he got in the airplane. But he said, I got two jobs. You get, a, you get to pick. You never get to pick. But today you get to pick. And I said, okay, what's the deal? And he said, well, you can stay here with the fourth platoon and you could, you could fly mortar watch and you'll be officer of the guard and you'll run guard mount and you'll have some extra duties. You're going to be the hooch mate control officer and, uh, and some other stuff, vector control. I have no idea what the hell half these things were. And he said to me, well, you can go to the second platoon. And I said, well, where's the second platoon? He said, well, it's up in Cantum. And he said, you'll go there. And that's it. And so I said to him, well, are there any extra duties? And he said, not that I know of. And I said, okay, I'll go. So that's where I wound up. When in, I got dropped off in front of the compound and I looked around and I, I'm looking at the guys that are guarding the place and I'm thinking, these guys aren't Vietnamese, they're too tall. Well, they were Nungs, Chinese, ethnic Chinese. And I meet the, the camp commander, Colonel Apt, who was a nice guy and he's walking around in a t-shirt and cut off jungle fatigues and shower shoes. And I thought, oh, this is, this is gonna be good. So anyway, he says, go over here. We make a little small talk and he said, go over here and we, we get uh, a top secret briefing from this guy named Harry Gole. And he was a major and he, we get into this room and it's black and he turns on a light and I can see the maps on the wall. And one is of Laos, one is of Cambodia. So this is Salem House and this is Daniel Boone and blah, blah, blah. And, and he said, and you can't tell anybody about this because this is a top secret meeting. And I looked at him and I said, Major, I just got here. I don't know anybody. Who am I going to tell? I'm looking at this map and I realized that Vietnam's not on it. And I thought, well, hold it. Wait, time out. Don't I, don't I, isn't that where we are in Vietnam? He said, the missions are all, and I thought, holy Christ, what have I done? And I'm, I'm terrified. I mean, I had no idea that this is what I volunteered for, but because I said I would do it, I, I'm, there's no way I'm, I'm walking back out that door. I said I'd do it. So after the briefing was over, I headed over to the latrine because I was a little sick to my stomach and walked in and closed the door. And I thought, well, this is kind of nice. At least I've got some privacy in here. And, start, and I start reading the graffiti on the walls. And somebody has written on the wall, hooray for the green bidets. And I, I looked at that thing and I burst out laughing. I thought, you know, somebody in the, this tropical jungle place knows what a day is. He's painted it green, pinned jump wings on it. And I thought, this is hysterical. I, I, I think I can do this. And so I did. That's my story. That I mean, that's kind of how I got there. Wow. And, uh, and, and while we're, uh, still on the, on the subject, I've, uh, linked, uh, your pre-order, uh, book, uh, the Amazon link here in the, the show description. And, uh, by the way, guys, Mr. Uh, goal, uh, actually has a, uh, a novel, um, out that he, uh, wrote, uh, he, he was in intelligence and, he kind of wrote a uh, a fiction combining uh, Joe Walker, kind of changing the name, Mike Shepard, uh, changing the name a little bit. And he, he wrote a great book as well. Um, and that's who gave uh, Mr. Frank his uh, his briefing, which is very, very interesting to say the least. But um, another interesting thing um, that you were kind of got on at the very beginning Um you uh you you trained uh you had your flight school here in my neck of the woods uh yeah or at least one of your school the, the second half was down at Rucker and then yeah. um when I left uh Vietnam that's where I was sent I originally and when you out process when you're leaving the country they they ask you where you want to go and what do you want to do and so there's this major <laughs> sitting at a table and he said to me, uh, where would you like to be assigned, Captain? And I said, I'd like to be assigned to the 6th Army Flight Detachment at the Presidio in San Francisco. And he looked at me with a little smile on his face, and he said, no, really, where do you want to go? And I said, I just told you, I want to go to the 6th Army Flight Detachment at the Presidio of San Francisco. And he said, Captain, captains don't go there. He said, now, where do you want to go? And I said, okay, well, I'll go to Rucker, and uh, and, and, and I've 
but I want, but I want to, I want to be a flight instructor if I go. I want to, I want to teach. And he said, "Well, you're going to enjoy hush puppies and sweet tea because that's where you're going, pal." And I said, "Well, I love hush puppies, but I can't stand that sweet tea. I'm not drinking that stuff." And it, and that's why I wound up teaching from the back seat of uh, of a bird dog. And, and I, I would think about when I went through as a trainee with Carl in the back seat, laughing the whole time because he's nuts. And uh, I thought, I I I want to be like Weaver, and I want to be like Carl, and I I want to. I want to treat my students with respect, and I want to I want to have fun, and and uh, and that's what that's what we did. It was it was great fun. I loved teaching from the back, and for what it's worth, early on in in this in May this of this spring, um, my wife and I, Katie and I, were up in a place called Westerly, uh, Rhode Island, in a place called Weekapog, actually uh, on the, down on the water. And we spent about four days there and, and at a, our son's house. And I came out of the place and I could hear an airplane going overhead. And I looked up and here goes this banner. And I've always tried to read the banner toes, but the, the airplane sounded amazingly familiar. <laughs> so I'm looking at it and Kate came out and I said, take a picture of that thing. And if there's no nose wheel on it, that's a bird dog. And it was, there was no nose wheel. It was a bird dog. So I, it's about four thirty in the afternoon, and I went back in the house and I grabbed my my uh, my computer, and Googled banner towing in Westerly, Rhode Island, and this thing Simmons Aviation pops up at the little airport here in town. No tower; it's an uncontrolled airfield. But Simmons Aviation, and they give a Warbird flights. He's got a T six that he drives around, and there's a couple of other things in there. And I called him on the phone and I said, you, you tow banners with bird dogs? And he said, yeah, I got two of them. I said, you have two? He said, yeah, he's got, I've got one that's restored and it's all done in search and rescue colors. And then I've got another one that we just got. It came from Japan, but we think it started out in, in, in Vietnam. We just have to trace its lineage. And I said, well, could I come over and see the airplanes? And he said, sure. What time do you open? 8.30, I'll be there. So the next morning we go over and uh, it, I did say to him on the phone when I called it, you got bird dogs. And I said, well, I flew that thing in Vietnam. I got over a thousand hours in it. So anyway, then we went over and his son, Ethan, the, the guy that owns the place, his name is Mark Simmons, Ethan Simmons, young man, about 19 years old, lovely guy. Um, he comes out and he shows me the airplanes. So we start talking about the bird dog and I start in yakking away like crazy. And uh, the next thing you know, he's rolling it out, the, the one from from Japan. And he said, "We're going to go, we're going to go fly this." And I said, "We are." He said, "Yeah, don't you want to go fly?" I said, "Oh yeah, I want to go fly." It. So we we climb in this thing and crank it up, and I'm in the back seat. And he said, "There's a stick alongside," and pop the rudder pedals up. So I pop the pedals up and put the stick in the the post down below my feet, and. Um, off we go, and I can. And Katie is filming all this, and uh, she said to some lady standing next to her, he, he, says, "He doesn't fly it from the back seat." Well, that's not true. I did fly it from the back seat. That's where I taught. But I got to fly that sucker for twenty minutes, and I'll tell you right now, it was like getting back on a bike. It was wow. just, just like getting back on a bike. It was so cool. And when uh, when I got out of it, I actually cried a little. I'll admit it. I did. I mean, it was it was just. The best. Is that the photo that you re that you recently shared with me, or is that another flight no, that trip that nice. you were? I would. That would have been that you just gotten. Um, I don't know whether I sent you the video or not, but that's me standing with the guy in front of the airplane and all. Yeah, that was just in the eighth of May, Kate's birthday. I've, I've shared that on Instagram, and I hate I don't have it, guys. I will I will share that again. Um, that that uh, that is a that's a great footage. Uh, and you did send the video. I I did yeah. get to see the video because you uh, I can hear you. You're in hog heaven up there, <laughs> it, it, and it's it's a beautiful sight. It it you you can yeah, I can tell why you love it so much. Uh, although I'm I'm a bit scared of heights, but if I was with a trusted pilot, I'd I'd get up there with y'all. Um. Gosh, that's uh so uh before we get into some of the back I should say back into SOG, how long did you end up teaching uh at Fort Rucker or, or teaching and all before 
you, I, you I taught I taught at Rucker uh, for uh, just a little under a year, and they disbanded Fixed Spring. Um, yeah. I got to work in the uh, Department of Standardization and Instructor Training, and uh, we were standards pilots um, training uh, other other pilots, and and actually doing a lot of work with some helicopter guys. Uh, the my my direct superior was a major. Um, and when they were getting rid of the bird dogs, they were taking them all over the country and delivering them to Civil Air Patrol and a bunch of other things. And I asked him if I could go deliver one, and he said no. <laughs> so I didn't get to go do that. Um, I instructed again uh, years and years and years later, uh, starting in uh, 2006. And I went to work for Boeing as an instructor on a, uh, an A321 Airbus and uh, taught in Korea uh, for nine years. Back and I commuted back and forth between Seoul and, and home uh, on a month to month to month basis. But that's that's what I did after I retired from uh, from Delta. Wow. So, okay. It, I didn't realize you went yeah, back no, into teaching after it, Delta. Wow. Instruct, instructing was fun. I mean, it it really was fun. And you just remembered this stuff that like Ray talked about and, and Weaver talked about, and then my company commander Orly Deaton, who I also did some training with actually he flunked me on a check right i i will admit that and uh with my own fault but that's okay and uh but those are the guys you remember and you you take that away you know um the uh you you mentioned frank greco and and uh at sog who was running the photo photoshop and then intel bucky took over on uh Dr. Michael Buckland took over on the, in the Photoshop and he saved all those photographs the night that the talk was blown up. That was, and I'm, 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 I may be jumping ahead here, but that was probably the worst two days of my life. And uh, I, 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 I think now I look around me and I don't know, you know, why I'm still sitting here. And um, but I am, and 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 you you brought it up, and it it's just one of those memories, and and you you think about it. So I'm going to take five minutes here, and I'm going to tell you the story of 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 that weekend because, and it's it it's in the book, but that's okay. I wrote it a little differently. Excellent. But we I've been flying all morning on the first of April, and uh, we always took off before dawn. Uh, and uh, was over in Laos and came back to Doc Tawa and needed to get gas and rearm and hopefully find some breakfast. And um, I was a captain now. And the um, two Charlie model gunship drivers grabbed me and they said, we need you to help us. And so we, they, they said, Doc Siang is being overrun and we can't get any air support and could you come? And the, the reason why they were asking me is not because I was massively armed in an unarmed bird dog, but they were hoping that I could get some air support. Um, so I said, yeah, and we gassed up and off we went and got over Doc Siang. And this is the first time in my life that I'd actually personally killed a guy. And uh, I will never forget it as long as I live. But, you know, you're indirectly because you're uh, forward air control and you're calling in airstrikes and so you're one step removed from the actual act but this time uh i actually did kill this guy and I, I i i would i stayed sick for the rest of the day um i flew over doc Siang and i was able to get the uh cobras and gunships released from um fo from uh doc toe the guys that supported us and uh the covers and the loaches and they came and they 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 provided the close air support until the air force showed up later on in the afternoon and they said i could i could leave now <laughs> so i did and uh and damn near ran out of gas going back to uh to doc to fuel up and then then went back to contum and that's the night that the the uh compound was overrun they broke through the wire blew up the taco and out the other side, and it was probably an inside job. Uh, I didn't get a whole lot of sleep that night, and but we were up again early, Phil and I, Phil Phillips and I, 
And Phil Phillips, by the way, is um, was well, he and I flew together for five months. Phil founded the International Bird Dog Association. So anybody oh, who's wow. involved with bird dogs, Phil Phillips, it's all his fault. At any rate, Phil and I took off in a Jeep, picked up the crew chiefs, went out to uh, to uh, Contum Airfield and pushed the airplanes out of the revetment. And we, we came up, there was a SOG photographer there to meet us. Normally it was Buckland. Today it wasn't. It was another another guy. And he... He, he said, this is my first mission. He'd never done this before. And he, we, we could tell that he was really pumped up. And uh, there was a little bit of a moon that light at night, and he had steel-rimmed glasses on, and you could see the moonlight flashing off his, the rims of his glasses. And, and the closer we got to launching, the, the faster his movements became. The guy was just amped. Um, and Phil said to him, we only have one rule here, and it's one pass and haul ass. And that's the rule, period. And so off we go. I, we found a base camp bigger than Contum City. Our <laughs> sucker was just huge over in Laos. And the area that we were going in was one of the farthest ends of our AO um, to, the, to, the, uh, to the west. And it... I mean, when I when I looked down into this thing, I thought, oh, my God. Well, I was a high ship and Phil was a low ship. And and uh, they made their first pass, went in and got a bunch of photographs. And this guy was begging Phil to go back and begging him and begging him and begging him. And, and I couldn't believe it when the airplane turned and went back. And it that gave everybody on the ground enough time to to figure out where we were going and what we were going to do. And, and naturally, we got bracketed by a couple of, of big machine guns, 50s and banging away at us. And um, the guy in the back seat was killed. And I I don't know how we got out of there. And Phil had his aileron shut up and he was yelling over the radio and, and he had his uh, the little chain that went back from a bell crank to the, his tail wheel was shot off. And uh, uh, I don't think I ever saw so many green tracers in my entire life and we got shot at every day so it was not anything new but this was unbelievable I mean, this was this was armageddon and uh somehow we managed to get back to doc toe and i called ahead to get a medevac and uh, it didn't matter um when they got this guy out of the back of phil's seat the back seat uh i thought there was blood all over the inside of his visor. Well, he didn't have a visor and he also didn't have much of a head left. It was just, it, it, the day couldn't have, and, and it, and it didn't get any better because when we, we pushed Phil's airplane off the runway and I flew him back to, to, uh, to Contum, crew chiefs had to come out and fix his airplane. We got back to Contum, find out that our platoon leader had taken off that morning at in Contum and, and, and crashed on takeoff, and he was dead. And so this was just like this tidal wave of stuff. And I don't know how you wade through that. And I, to this day, I, I, I don't know how we waded through it. There's one more little piece of this story. A couple of years ago, there was a, on Facebook on the side page, there was a tombstone that pops up a photograph and it's got this guy's name on it. And he said that he was killed in a, an airplane crash. And he said it was near the Cambodian border. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I wonder if I ought to respond to that. And because I'm such a big mouth, I did. And it turns out that the next thing I know, I've got an email and it's from this guy's son and the boy oh. had not, had not been in contact with his dad for years and years and years. And now he wanted to know. And so I, when I responded to the photograph, I said, the, this didn't happen near the Cambodian border. And it wasn't because of an airplane crash. And I know because I was there and that's why this, that's why I got contacted um, by this young man. And he sent me a picture of him and his daughter and wanted to know about his dad. And so I told him, not, not that it was a, a, a 
a catastrophe of our own making. I, I told him that his dad was a hero because he was. He volunteered for a, a mission that was awful, and and he was and Mike Buckland tried to talk him out of it, and he couldn't do it. And I've carried this guy with me all my life. All of it. And this was, it didn't, things didn't get any better at SOG as, as the year progressed. It, they got worse because we were increasing our activity when everybody else was backing down. We were, we were the blocking force on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Mike explained that in his, his, um, his podcast, but that's what we were doing. We were slowing them down from supplying the South so that we could, that, so that the South Vietnamese could buy, buy time to get better, to actually take over the war for themselves, which was a pipe dream. But in any event, um, that's what we did. And, and so our exposure increased as the exposure to the regular troops began to decrease. And, um, one of the things, one of the offshoots of all of this was this Operation Ford Drum, where we became the photographers of everything. We took pictures of everything, bomb damage assessment and, and visual recon and anything we saw and anything we found, we photographed it. And it was all done low level. And you can't see squat at 1,500 feet, so you're down at 400 feet, 300 feet, 500 feet. And the low guy is right on the trees. And... Uh, when you're flying down on the treetops, you you remember that you got to make big old pedal turns because you don't want to put the wing down. You'll you'll catch the wingtip in a treetop, and the next thing you know, your your ass over tea kettle uh, crashing through the jungle. So I mean, it was just all, and it didn't get any better. So I think in a book, when we get into March of 1970, I I called it. The, our bloody spring, and it was. I mean, excuse me, get another frog in my throat. I, 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 uh, I first learning about uh, you guys through Bucky and, uh, and of course, Mr. Greco's book. Uh, those of y'all, if y'all are, if y'all are able to find the copy, I, I mean, they're out there, but they're astronomical, but they, uh, if you can find a reasonable copy, I, I do recommend getting that. Uh, sorry, there's a glare, but uh, it it speaks uh, a lot about uh, the the two night thief, especially Mr. Frank. Uh, there's a lot of photos uh, that Bucky took that are in this book. Um, it's uh, I, 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 it's just harrowing hearing. Uh, you know, we've uh, and that's one good thing, and why I'm glad I started off the month with you because. I've just inundated the channel with with mostly recon and and ground the the ground side of things and you guys and, and especially in the Ford Drum uh, mission uh, were were flying some very very dangerous dangerous missions and uh, I, I, I that's why I pre-ordered the book is literally the moment you said it was ready for pre-order because I, I I can't wait to 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 learn more and and hear about uh stuff that you guys did um and our all of our hats are off to you uh for for your service first off but um would you uh would you be okay with getting into uh some questions sure okay um and just right off the bat somebody had was asking um let me uh this is a a, a friend of mine mr red Matt. he was a, a marine uh very early on uh, in the Vietnam War, uh, he was asking, "What kind of uh, bird did you fly to take recon pictures with Sog?" And well, I think I've got a photo to share. Yeah. Let's see here. Let's see. Oop. Not there. Hold tight, guys. I'm sorry. Here's one, but back to Contum we go. That's me in the front seat, and that's Buckland in the back seat, and I think Phil Phillips took the picture, and if you can read the tail number, it's 001534, and that's a number that 
I, I will never forget that number. <laughs> but that's that was that was me. I, I just uh, that thing has got to be 50 years old. And I've got the original up in a folder upstairs. And that's a copy of the original airplane. But that that was they came on in the inventory in the army in around 1947. And that's when I was two years old. And the airplane that I flew, I think, was built in 1950. And that's when I started kindergarten with Sister, Sister Mary Carola at St. Ignatius in Hicksville on Long Island, New York. And that's how old that airplane is. That's how old I am. <laughs> I've, uh, I've got another really good uh, a color photo that I'm about to bring up. But while we're uh, looking at it in action, so to speak, there's really two questions that I've got. Uh, before we get to some more viewer questions, sorry guys. Um, but I've always been—I've uh, heard it from a, uh, a a different Air Force pilot. And I don't think he was Spaff. I can't remember if he was a FAC or it was Mr. Don Fulton. But uh, did the tail numbers for y'all have any significance in where y'all were located or anything, or were they just random uh, tail numbers? No, they were just random. Whoever showed up, you know, where they put the airplane. And uh, that just happened to be one that was up in Khantoum, and I, I wound up flying it most of the time. Wow. Okay. Um, and one last one, since we're on this quite, uh, on this good picture as well. What um what was your? I know inside you did, and I'm sure we'll get to that in a bit. You had your own armament, uh, but what was uh what, what was your standard uh, loadout for the bird dog when you were going out for a for a flight, so to speak. If you look, if you look under the, the, you can see the rocket tubes under the wings, and we only had two tubes under each wing, so we carried four rockets. The normal idea there for marking targets was to use white phosphorus, and the reason why you used it uh, as opposed to like whatever smoke grenades were made out of was because the phosphorus was a denser smoke that went straight up, and uh, uh, it was easier to see. And uh, that's what you marked with. Um, if you were going to go do something where you thought you might need something other than white phosphorus, we could take 17-pound high-explosive warhead rockets, uh, and we could also take uh, flechettes. And uh, oh. so the, we put the flechettes in the inboards and the uh, the HE on the outboard in the outboards, and the uh, flechette is what it. Uh, I used the day that at at Doc Siang that day, uh, when uh, the uh, the sapper was killed with the rocket that I fired, um, the flechette round is what we used. Uh, that's the same airplane. It's one five three four, and uh, um, the 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 special sheet metal <laughs> where the bullets hit are mostly out towards the wingtips, but. Um, uh, that's I, that's the airplane I flew. And Jim Shelley was the crew chief. Jim Shelley and Ben Brown. And uh, I will say about Ben Brown that Ben Brown is the reason I'm sitting here. And those guys, they kept those airplanes working beautifully. They were just marvelous guys. Marvelous. And I've told that to Ben a million times since that. They uh they, they definitely look like workhorses, and I mean for the for the beating y'all took, and for them to like you said for for them to keep them operational, that is a a testament to their skill. I mean, because y'all were definitely flying through it uh <laughs> on on more than one occasion. Uh, let's see. Wow, there are some good questions. Uh, that one's a little later. I'll wait for that one. Um, there was a good one. Jason's got it. Let me exit off this. Um, how many pilots uh, do you remember, do you know of that were lost for Fort Drum? Um, when I went home, Fort Drum was just starting up. And so we lost uh, the photographer in the back seat. But afterwards, after I left, uh, Sinkowski and uh, uh, Pizzicreta and I think Vic Wood um, and whether or not they were directly involved with Ford Drum, I'm not sure, but I, I think they were. Um, it was a pretty pretty big inc uh, incursion into uh, into especially Cambodia. Um, the mission itself was uh, was a pain in the ass, and uh, the reason why when 
initially when we started the mission, we didn't know its name and we didn't know why we were doing it. But we were flying damn near to the Mekong River and it was part of the monsoon, monsoon season. And so if you, when you flew in a straight line, you didn't burn nearly as much gas as when you zigzag down valleys. Well, when the visibility started going down and you started zigzagging, the first thing you started thinking about was fuel. And we had, uh, we had a, uh, a non-pilot major at uh, CCC who did not like us very much. <clears throat> and uh, he had not a lot of compassion for what we were doing. We were actually flying almost 135 hours a month. Uh, and we never knew that there was a limit to how long or how much we could fly. At any rate, he said he has flying every day. And as the monsoons started and the, and the weather got worse, uh, I went to him and I said, you know, I, I just want you to know that if I have to, I'm going to go into Thailand and uh, if I can't get back. And he looked at me and he said, Captain, if you got your map with you? And I said, yeah. And we had a great big, big map. And I kept it folded up in about four parts down in a leg pouch to below my knee from in my flight suit. And I, he said, may I have your map? And so I reached down, I pulled it out and handed it to him. We were sitting in his office and he proceeded to take a scissor and cut the map off at the Mekong River so that Thailand went in the wastebasket. And he said, you're not going to Thailand. And I looked at him and I thought, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I can't believe that. So, and I walked out. I didn't want to get in an argument with him. I absolutely didn't want to get in an argument with this guy. So I saluted him and he didn't return my salute, turned around and walked out of the office. And I started thinking about it. And I said, well, you dope. There's no big deal here. We got a great big map in the ready room out at, at the Contum Airfield, and it and I can figure out the heading from wherever I am on the border how to get up to to uh, Ubon, and uh, no big deal. I'll just make a call and say, "Hell, I'm lost. Give me a DF steer, and they'll bring me up to you." Right it in. And then I said, wow. I, "God, I hope I get to do that because I want to call this guy on the phone and say, hey, Major, wish you were here.' <laughs> I made it made it silent." <laughs> That's great. I love that. There he is thinking he's going to get you. And little did you know, he know that you'd find him out one way or another. Well, it was pretty funny. But anyway, he was not a nice guy. I, he, yeah, he, he he didn't sound like he was. Um, oh, Jason's got a really good question. Can you talk about when you first met Bucky and what your first impressions of him are? And those of you that are listening, Bucky is Mike Buckland, who we've had as a guest. Well, I met Bucky in the in the photo lab, and he wasn't running it then. He was working for Frank Greco. Bucky eventually took over from Greco. But when I first met him, um, I liked him instantly. There was there was there was nothing contrived about Mike. He was who he was, and uh, he he's a he was a genuinely good person. He was a a very caring guy. And um, he wasn't hardened by what was going on. He and he'd been here. This was like his third tour, so it's it's not like he was a new guy to side. He'd been there for for quite a while, um, and I I lost track of him after the war, and found him again. Don't exactly know how, but it was after I had retired from Delta. And it was very unfortunate because Mike had done a bunch of things. He'd flown in Africa. He, he'd worked for the police force. He, he did a lot of uh, corporate flying. Um, but he also got a PhD in aviation science, and he was teaching at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. And when I talked to him on the phone, I said, I can't tell you how many times I've flown into that damn airport because I love to fly to Anchorage in, in the, for, when I was working for Delta and Western. And uh, I said, God, if I'd have known you were there. And he said, well, can you come back? I said, no, I don't know. I'm not flying Delta anymore. I'm not flying Delta anymore. So, it, but it was, but we stayed in contact and we had some wonderful discussions. Um, and Mike was, Mike played a, a, a huge role in filling me in on, on what, what we were doing and why. 
because until I asked him, I had no idea. I didn't even know that there was an Operation Ford drum until he told me. And he said, and I was the one who was setting up the photo missions. And I said, you son of a bitch, you're trying to kill me. <laughs> oh, no, he's just, I just love Mike. I, I, I will love him till the day I die. He's just, he's, he's one of the, he's, he's a reason why you love people. That's Mike Buckland. He's, he's mm. that, he's that good a guy. He is the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, absolutely brilliant and one of the most kind men I've, I've ever come in contact with. He is as sweet as they come. Uh, well, just an outstanding guy. Um, gosh, I hate I miss, I, I skipped over this from earlier, but this is a good question for those that didn't know. Um, during what years did you serve in Vietnam? I got there on September the 4th of 1969. And I, I left uh, on September the 4th of 1970. And uh, I very briefly considered extending for another six months, but I didn't want to go do something else. I wanted to keep flying what I was flying. And I realized that I'd probably run out of all the good karma that I was ever going to have. And, uh, and so uh, I, didn't, um, I didn't extend. And if, if, I, if I may, just a, a, a little funny deal here. The first night that I was in Vietnam, we landed in a train at night and I went in, the, I got sent to this thing. It was where I was supposed to sleep and there were no screens on the windows and no screen on the doors. And I pulled a poncho liner over me and fell asleep. And I, I was bitten to death by mosquitoes. <laughs> my eyes was, was swollen shut. I could barely see where I was going. And I, I wound up making my way to, to the uh, medical tent or medical Hooch, and I was allowed to sleep on a gurney, and he gave me a shot of cortisone. And the next morning, I woke up, and I had to go to meet this major and get assigned to a unit, which was then the 18th. And my face was cratered. I mean, it was absolutely cratered, it, and it, and I I couldn't shave. And I and and when I wrote the book, I described my face as looking like an English muffin. And the the, the publisher that bought the memoir, Only the Light Moves, is based in Yorkshire, England. And so the young lady that was doing some of the editing emailed me back and she said, you may want to consider changing the description of your face from an English muffin to a crumpet. And I, I started to laugh. And, I, and she said, because crumpets are, have holes in them and English muffins are smooth, and so I took a picture of a package of Thomas's English muffins, and I and I made sure that I highlighted the nooks and crannies, and I sent that to her. And I said, in the U.S., we don't have crumpets; you can't find them. And I said, but we have English muffins, and they have nooks and crannies, and that's what my face looked like. I thought that was just, and that was the only time she wanted to correct anything. It was just change it to crumpets, but we didn't. Wow, that's. <laughs> That's hilarious. I uh, and again, guys, please. Uh, I, I did link a, uh, a a a connection to Amazon for the pre-order. It is out, and uh, I believe they sh start shipping in December. Um, but I've already pre-ordered mine, and I recommend y'all do the same because this will be the real uh, first-hand glimpse from someone who actually served, uh, getting a, a look into the the 219th and 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 their history and especially with sog um this is a little bit later in the war but uh I, i'll be interested in your uh answer for this one as well um some believe that the war could have been won and that vietnamization was working what are your personal thoughts on that i uh i i'm, I'm gonna hedge my bets here and uh when i wrote this memoir, I tried to stay away from the politics of all of this. Personally, for me, I thought that the futility was profound. And on the back cover of the book, there is a, a photograph of, of uh, puffs of smoke where we were bombing. And what we were doing is we were bombing some bridges and, I, and and there was a section of the trail that had disappeared and we couldn't find it and couldn't find it and couldn't find it. And I, I 
was out looking for this, this thing, the, this section of road, and went down a, a, a valley that was so narrow I couldn't turn the airplane in it. So I, had, I Dutch rolled up and down the sides looking, and, and uh, I thought that I found something and finished flying down the valley, popped out on the other side, came back down around in a different direction, but back to what I had remembered on the ground, and I found bridges. And there was a road. So when came back around again, and somehow I no, nobody was shooting. I couldn't believe it, but I, I, I counted 47 bridges down this road, 47 of them. So the photograph on the back is a picture of me calling in an airstrike, and we were taking out these bridges. We took out three of them. And uh, I mean, it was a tricky, it was a tricky run for the fighters to get in. And uh, the gorge was extremely narrow. So that we took out three of them, I thought was a great accomplishment uh, and, and blew them, gone, obliterated. Next morning I went back and the green bamboo that I could see from the light where the bridges had been rebuilt was like this to me. And I thought, you bet, you bet. These people are as tenacious as hell and they're not going anywhere. And we don't live here and they do. And so why, why would I be surprised by this? I wasn't at all. It, it, I would have been surprised if they hadn't tried it. And they accomplished this in one night, three bit bridges out of green bamboo. And I'm looking at them thinking, spitting into the wind here, pal. Spitting into the wind. How, I mean, what, what kind of bridges are, are these? Are these for humans or is this for truck, truck, or? trucks and trucks and bikes and anything you can get over? That's it was a road that the, the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was a trail in some places, but in a lot of places, but it was, it was a road a goddamn yeah. highway. So, yeah. Wow. I mean, overnight, overnight, uh, three, three bridges overnight, green bamboo, completely rebuilt. Amazing. And you know, yeah. did, did Buckley explain how they ran the trucks? They, these guys just drove one stretch of road. They didn't drive from the north all the way to the south and then come back again. They they had a section of road that they, they, that they drove, and they were totally mm -hmm. familiar with it. And so you what what you looked for part of the Ford Drum thing was to find the was to find the turnaround points because if you found a turnaround, you found a choke point, and if you found a choke point, you could stop it. And you could stop it for a day or two or three, depending upon how many trucks you got backed up in there. And so one of the things that the side teams did was they'd put guys on the ground, they'd lay in an ambush, blow a truck, and then blow a bunch of them, bottleneck, and then get the hell out of there. So in Plaster's book, he talks about doing this. And this is the one where he takes the air horn. Um, no, it's not the one where he takes the air horn. It's before that. He and Krupa, this is the one where Fritz Krupa, uh, who was later killed over poly, uh, in the play drain, in uh, the play trap valley. Uh, mm -hmm. Krupa has a, a brownie instrumatic, and he, he gets the team lined up with the driver that they've captured, and Krupa's taking pictures of them in front of this Chinese truck, and then they run away. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> The, the you got I mean y'all are uh, a different different breed I'm I'm uh, some folks were kind of asking uh, what the terrain was like and while we're speaking on that I'm gonna bring up another question while I'm getting some pictures together because this is a really good question I don't think I've ever even asked you this myself what kind of navigation did you use was it just dr or vfr as he which added way up is, which way is the wind blowing? We going that way. We going that way. <laughs> you had a map, and you you went uh, distance, time, and heading, and uh, and you did the best you could do. And then you you knew that you could pick up a uh, uh, heading out of out of a dock tow about two seven zero to take you pretty much into the AO. Um, you know, it was just it was all a wag. Go that way and hope for the best. And That's he was, I mean, I, you know, it, there, there were no. Right. He was, yeah, he was asking about radar sites, giving y'all locational bearings or anything like that to come no, in on or no, 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 no. The only guy we were talking to was Hillsborough and that was a C-130 up okay. above us. And, and he, he was for direct air support. 
and, and that's that was it. But nobody was telling us the direction to go in. We were just, you know, and I I hear you and fly over. That's what the Cubby guys did. They, they would the, the, the teams on the ground would say, I hear you, Cubby, come, and then they would start directing them by sound. Well, speaking of that. Would you, in any situation that you ever got in, did you have to ever get in contact with a ground team or anything, or sure. were, were you? So, so yeah. you did you could get direct access to the to the recon team on the ground if you needed to. If, if I needed to, I could. We had a we had the frequencies and uh, uh, we knew what they were on. We knew where the teams were. Our job was not directly working with the with the with the uh, the U.S. Special Forces, although we did work with the Vietnamese. Uh, recon teams on the ground but those guys our guys worked almost exclusively with the uh, air force covey and and a covey rider which was a, uh, a, a usually a, a sog recon man who had spent a lot of time on the ground and now was in the airplane helping to direct so for instance plas john plaster when he stopped running around he went and became a covey rider um oh we've got, actually got a ccc hatchet force member uh mr terry Cadenback, who is uh is a has been a guest uh on here before he's got a great question he was uh ccc when doc siang was overrun we were, he was told at the hatchet forces uh they y'all they were that was the first time the use of laser guided mu munitions were you aware of that no um when i got there when i got on station over doc siang there were only three airplanes, me and the two Charlie model gunships. The artillery, I don't know who was calling that in, it wasn't me. Um, and if the only laser guided stuff I was aware of, of or any kind of guided stuff was uh, the big 155 long toms, the big the big long cannons, but anything coming from the, from the Air Force, you know, I, I didn't know about it. I, I wasn't, I don't remember ever using uh, an F4 or an A1 that had anything like that. Everything was right down uh, close. So no, not not at Doc Siang that I recall. And, and I'm just saying that when I was there and it had just erupted, that was the first day. Um, and I was there for five hours worth of gas. Uh, all I was trying to do is keep them, keep the place not from being overrun. Oh, here's a, another little bit. Uh, there, uh, he's referring to Mike Buckland's photo. What was the little shark fin looking antenna in the middle of the appendage do? Uh, that was an ADF, and that was a, a VHF antenna. Okay. And uh, I believe in one of those, y'all actually caught around in one of y'all's, uh, I believe that uh, photo Bill is. Carr had one go through that, and uh, so did another guy, Mel Schlentner, who wasn't working for SOG. Um, and Kraut, with a picture of his, he's got his finger in it, like his finger's in a dike. <laughs> so, uh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that is, uh, I've got some, uh, a little bit of, a uh, few photos of, uh, and I believe that's, near the Ho Chi Minh Trail somewhere. Uh, beautiful landscape, but my God, I wouldn't want to be on the ground down there. Well, and what what what, were, what do you think you were uh, doing right here? Were you on the way somewhere probably? Or I, were, I, was I this some we may have been. And uh, if, if the picture were a little bigger and I could see a little bit more of the river, I, I, I think that may be part of a, a stretch of the river we call the bra. But- um, Ah, okay. But- uh, that was one of the things that Goal showed me on the very first uh, briefing that I got too. Was was that? But that's that is actually not as dense as the jungle could get. Um, and you can see a trail there, uh, just to the well. Uh, if you if you look close enough. And at any rate, it, it that that was it was more mountainous than Laos. Cambodia was a little flatter. It was much more mountainous than Laos. I've got a, actually a good photo of you're talking about the density of the uh, jungle right here. Let me show. And I think you were flying on this flight. This is one of Bucky's that he had sharing of 
I believe y'all came across comma wire right here uh, yeah. in the photo. Yes, 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 exactly. That's exactly what it was. And Bucky found that. I mean, look, I mean, guys, look at the thickness of the jungle right there. And they're, you know, they're, they're having to spot. If you follow my cursor, that's, that's the pole. And the, the line is running literally across the river into the thickest jungle I've ever seen in my life. So, uh, to be able to spot that, you, I mean, that shows you the eagle eyes the guys have up there. Although they are low, but you still got to have eagle eyes right there. <laughs> um, and I think I was curious about this myself. Um, I think he said this was you guys as well, that y'all had found a, a group of NBA moving out in the open. And I can't remember uh, if he said y'all ended up getting some airstrikes in on them, but uh, it, I clearly a, a well-defined trail. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely well-defined trail. I was not in on this, and this looks like it was, it, it would looks like it might have been after, a, uh, well, the, the trees were all down, so so there's been some bombing in there. But um, I, I think this may have been Bucky and uh, Phil or Bucky and Doug Kraut, but I wasn't there this day. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that'd been pretty well- banged around Give them a oh yeah you can you can tell that it uh caught some kind of and uh, let me share one more of your photo coming into contum to folks can see what the scenery of what you're talking about uh, a little bit is and actually what is uh what is that bottom photo i'm is that, that looks uh, like hallway that didn't look like contum that looks like hallway okay. to me okay uh, and this, uh, that, that would be that would be the duck Blah river right there in, in oh Columbia. wow Okay, then. Okay. Wow. I'm, I'm glad I've got that mislabeled. I need to fix that real yeah. quick. Um, we've got a few more good questions right here. Um, what was the uh, pounds of fuel the, the plane held for, for an average out? About five, hour, about five hours. Five hours worth of fuel. Wow. Fill it up and wash the windows about five hours, Red. So it, um, you just, you did it by, you look at the gauges and uh, I, I, I bet once, a long time ago, I knew how many pounds of fuel that thing carried, but I certainly don't remember anymore. Did you uh, ever, I know you said at least once you came in on fumes, but uh, did you ever come close to actually not coming in on fumes and like no. undershoot? No, no. Wow, always, that's good. Always paying attention. I, I absolutely did not want to be mm. not where I was supposed to be. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. Um, absolutely zero. You do have to respect the, uh, the, the engineers that the NBA had or the people's army. Absolutely. Uh, they, okay. they were, go ahead. They said, said 40 gallons. So he knew. Thanks Ray. I knew you'd save me again. Oh yeah. He did say, look, yep. yep. Right there on the private chat. I just saw that. Yep. Thank you, sir. Um, yep. Red always flying by the seat of his pants. Um, I know that one's uh, here's the two really good ones. What are some of the craziest things that you saw while flying? And maybe uh, that could be not necessarily combat or it could just be anything. Well, anything you thought was crazy because anything you thought was crazy had to be pretty dang crazy. <laughs> well, the, the, the one I, the one I loved and I, I had to ask Buckland about this was that we had this radio relay station, Leghorn, at the at the top of a of a mountain it was kind of tough to get up and down and the vietnamese were always trying to get up it uh to attack the place but they couldn't and uh this one day they were hauling uh mortars up in pieces and they were going to set up and start lobbing mortars up on top of the the place so i'm looking for them and i come around and here's a guy standing on the side of the hill jumping up and down waving an orange panel and it's it's one of the munch yards that was stationed up on top and he'd fallen off i think he'd be a roll off in his sleep i don't know but he's jumping up and down waving this panel and i if i spoke rade i'd know what he was yelling at me but i i figured he was one of our guys and so i we got the uh the king bees to come in and pick him up the king bees were there because they were resupplying Leghorn. And the deal was that these guys got five bucks a guy for every time they crossed the border and, and did the resupply. And so 
here comes this CH-34, this King B, and it, the door goes open, and out comes a box. Maybe a box of ammo, maybe a box of C rations, but it was a box, not more than one, a box. And then this guy lifts off and he goes back. Here comes another guy. Door comes open, a box comes out. So this is a daisy chain of king bees coming in, resupplying leghorn a box at a time for five bucks a pop per man permission. And Perfect. I thought to myself, Jesus, if I had five bucks for every time I crossed the border, I, I could go home now. I could buy a yacht. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we we find this guy on the side of the hill. They go in and they pick him up, and the next thing you know, the Vietnamese are they're lobbing mortars up on, and and Leghorns getting attacked. So they King bees stop the resupply, come flying down and start shooting at, at the the North Vietnamese and the mortars. They run down a the hill, they blow the mortars up, and and so everybody goes home happy. And they all made a bunch of money. They continued the daisy chain. I thought, this is absolutely Keystone Cops stuff. I mean, this you can't you can't make this up. You know, this is just too funny. The um at Doc Siang, there was a loach that got shut down. Well, a lot of airplanes got shut down at Doc Siang, but on that first day, but a loach got shut down. And he auto rotated right down to the runway, and the pilot and the observer jumped out and took off for a bunker. So they're running across the airfield, and, and the North Vietnamese are walking rounds up the runway, and they are passed in mid-flight by five. I guess they must have been. Uh, they weren't. They weren't Montagnards, so they had to be Arvins running for the loach. The pilot and the the observer are heading for the bunker. These guys are running for the loach, thinking they're going to get a ride out of town. The thing's not moving. So they dive into the helicopter and they start, they lay in there waiting for the, somebody to come and fly it away. It's not going pretty soon. The rounds are being walked in. One guy sticks his head out, realizes what's happening. And now it's a mad race back to the bunker. And I'm watching this and I thought for a moment, because this was such a horrible morning, but I thought this is just, you. this is too surreal. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. And I, I looked at that and I've, I've just sort of never forgotten that either. I thought... You know, just I, I want to survive. I want to live, but can't blame them. No, nah, wow, 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 wow. Uh, there's uh, two good questions coming up, and one one's actually my favorite, especially with the pilots. Um, did the uh, plane have any kind of armor around the cockpit? It had an armored seat that was supposed to stop around. Not necessarily, but it had an armored seat. Um, I took a flak vest and I sat on a flak vest. I took my 38 and I, I originally started wearing a shoulder holster and I realized that this wasn't doing me very much good. So I took the 38. I had a, a, a regular gun belt and I, I put the, the, uh, the gun between my legs and uh, because I wanted to have children later. And then I, I I had a parachute, but I was never high enough to jump, so I knew I wasn't getting out. But I took the parachute anyway and put it behind my back and sat on it. And for my for my troubles, when I got back to Rucker, I wound up getting this thing called a pylonautal cyst from this iron armored seat. And it's right at the base of your tailbone. There's a little space where we used to have a tail, and we don't have one anymore, obviously. But there is this empty thing there, a little duct that filled up with fluid Ooh, and got bigger and bigger painful. and pretty soon it looked like a like a ping pong ball. And uh, I thought, you know, the and I went and I had it operated on and removed while I was at Rucker. And I thought the shame of this was that it didn't happen while I was in Vietnam so that I could have gotten a purple heart, purple for heart. A, a butt booster. <laughs> and I thought that'd be kind of cool, but no such luck. Hurt like hell. <laughs> oh, I was about to say, when you said it got to the size of, even the small ones are painful, but when you said it got to the size of a ping pong ball, I was about to say, ow. Well, some of us are total cowards when it comes to going to the doctor. <laughs> anyway. I, I'm I'm not a fan of the dentist or any of the doctors, so I'm right there with you. I go, but I'm, I'm not a fan. Um, and uh, one of the... Well, I haven't seen it come up. I know it's going to come up, but uh, and I'll go ahead and ask it. 
what did you, when you were going out, what did you carry uh, as your personal, uh, I guess that's you say, armament in the, in the cockpit? Did you only rely on the pistol? Did you carry a CAR-15, an M16? Did you carry grenades? What, what did you carry with you? I had a CAR-15 uh, so I could collapse the stock and bungee it to the door on the right-hand side. And that's the door that opened and closed. I had a 38 that I wore. And, uh, and then I had initially when I first started flying it, um, I had the frag grenades on a wire behind my seat. I could reach behind and grab one for it out the window. And the first day I took rounds into the airplane, I realized that, that was the stupidest thing I'd ever done because if a round ever caught one of those things, I'd be dead because it would blow up and blow the airplane up. So I got rid of all those frag grenades, never took them back with me and just took smoke grenades. Um, and uh, that, so that's, that's what I carried. I, I will admit to the fact that I'm probably one of the worst shots in the history of mankind. And I couldn't hit the broadside of a barn if I was standing next to it, but it, I just, you know, I had the weapons and, and uh, um, I, I fired the, the rifle out the window a couple of times and I actually uh, used the 38 one day that's in the book. So I won't, I won't go there about the, me and the 38 and the guy in the rice paddy, but, at any rate, that's what I carried. I think oh, I had a man. knife. I had a knife. <laughs> I, I, I know the uh, the rice patty story is going to be amazing, guys. So that, in, in my opinion, maybe that one alone and some of the four drums is enough to get the book because it's it, it's very very good. Um, and you mentioned uh, hanging out the window. Um. Did you uh did 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 the saw guys in the back did they have anything or were you pretty much since they were in the back seat with no window were you the were you the one letting them uh are you shooting and letting them kind of handle the stick while you were going so to speak no they uh they would shoot out the window um and they could lean forward and and the, the big window was big enough so that he could get forward enough to to fire out the window and 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 hopefully not hit the strut. Uh, when uh, Plaster showed up at Doc Toe and introduced himself as the Plastic Man, and I said to them, I said to him, I said, well, what's your real name, Sergeant? Because I could be Captain Kangaroo this morning, but I'd like to know <laughs> what your name is. So he introduces himself, and we were going out into a really nasty area, and I really wasn't paying much attention, and I should have, because Plaster's got a box with him. He's got a sea ration box. Well, what it was was a bomb. And he built a bomb, and and in it was C4 and claymores all around the outside, and got him stacked in this damn box. And he had figured out he was a demo guy by uh, training, and so he had figured out how to how to use a smoke grenade to mark the flight of the box down. And he's got it on his lap in the back of the airplane. We take off, and he said, "You know where any hooches are?" I said, "Why the hooches everywhere?" I said, "What do you?" He said, "Yeah, well, just fly over, you know, and get me low enough." So I said, "Okay." So. Next thing I know, this thing hits me in the shoulder and it's going out the window on the right. And he's banged me with the box and out it goes. And I see the red smoke and then wham! And it, it was a, just a giant thing. And I thought, God, Frank, what a dope you are. You should have asked him what it was. And I, I for years, I, I, I thought I, I when I, I, I sent him an email and asked him a question years and years later and explained to him who I was and said, and, and by the way, some whack job brought a gigantic bomb of C4. And he said, yeah, that was me. <laughs> okay. That I, 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 uh, I, I, there was someone else that, that built a bomb also. And, uh, I, Bob Howard, Bob Howard built a bomb and theirs evidently didn't go quite as well as yours and they almost brought the the airplane or the helicopter down because they didn't time the air burst right and it did not go very well i'll uh i'll have to get more info on that but that's the first time i've heard of uh the plastic man uh building a bomb to drop out the window <laughs> what what a guy i, I mean was, what a he guy was very funny he was very funny um this is a great photo. I want to see. This is you fresh in country. I'd like to see what you have to say about that one. That's. I was terrified and bored to tears. 
And what what, what kind of aircraft are you uh, in front that's of a, right there? That's, that's a, a, a U1 Otter. So it's a, it's got a great big radial engine on it, uh, and it's got a tailwheel, and it's at ten passengers and, and a, a pilot, co-pilot, and a crew chief, and um, it's built by De Havilland, a Canadian airplane, and they're still up in Canada now, and um, in the in the front end of this thing, up in the cockpit, it was a single post that came up between the pilots. And then the controls branched off like this in a in a in a V, so it actually looked like a big Y. And each one had a control wheel to steer with, and you could um, you could trim the airplane so that would move a little tab on the elevator, and you could make the nose up or down depending upon how the airplane was loaded. Well, we had a crew chief that used to go to sleep all the time in the back, and he'd never wear his seatbelt, so. If you put your foot up on the footrest, you could crank and brace the this this big Y uh, control yoke with your knee. You could crank a whole lot of nose down trim in this thing, and and of course you're not letting it go down. You just have got a ton of it cranked in there. And as soon as you drop your foot off the the uh, footrest, the yoke would go forward, and so would the crew chief. <laughs> And we could fire him about three seats down the aisle. And he used to just piss him off. He said, Captain, if you do that, I was the captain. Lieutenant, if you do that again, I'm going to get you. Lieutenant, I'm going to get everybody in that unit to get you. And I thought, well, I guess I better stop doing that. <laughs> that was a sight to see. My goodness. It was, oh, a great airplane. it was really fun to fly. And they still use them up in Alaska. A lot of them have been converted to big turboprop engines so they're not as pretty as they were but but it was a really cool airplane to fly in. and it had a, a wing that was about like that thick and it you could lift anything with it i mean it was just extraordinary and uh we used to take off from a place off the the coast of uh Quangnai called Kulare island and the runway went downhill and it was really short so you you could pump flaps down and so we leave the flaps of pretty much up and pop the brakes and go screaming down his hill and just about rotation time you tell the guy not flying pump them and he put them down at about 10 degrees of flap and the airplane would jump off the ground like this it would go, and 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 then you kind of float out over the end of the runway looking down at the water below you and, and it was just fun to do you know just it was just fun to do just wow it was, so it was a great airplane to fly. It was really the mission was boring to death, but it and I think I'd been there about three weeks or so, maybe maybe two weeks, and I was feeling very full of myself at that time. And I was totally wrong. <laughs> oh wow, this is a great question. Uh did you ever hear of any communist aircraft in your AO? Or see no. any? No. no, I I never saw any. Um, I I was under the impression that um, MiGs never got down as far as we were, although some guys swore up and down that they had saw them. Um, the only, uh, we, you know, obviously we saw people on the ground, and uh, I will say that on more than one occasion I had uh, the uh, North Vietnamese over in Laos call on our supposedly top secret frequencies and wish me good morning. Oh. And, and and one morning they actually knew my name. And they said, Good morning, Doti. Daiwi Doti. And I I I just I, I almost got sick out of the airport. How the hell did they know that? You know, you just but that's that that uh that just gave me uh a, a, a shiver <laughs> uh, up my spine. Wow. Uh uh wow uh man uh red's wanting to know uh how how fast did the plane fly at the the otter the bird dog the bird dog would do bird 100 dog. miles an hour straight down <laughs> wow <laughs> but you have to be going straight down i think you know about 100 110 depending upon whether you had a fixed pitch or a variable pitch prop it but it but it was not fast and in 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 truth you didn't really want it fast you wanted you wanted it slow enough so that you could see. And the trick the trick there was two things. One, if you were the low ship, get down. 
you wanted to be on the treetops so that your rate of closure over the ground was that fast. And the other thing you wanted to do, regardless of what position you were flying, was to bury your foot in a rudder. Bury your foot in a rudder. And because if you did that and then use a little opposite aileron, it would pull the nose around and they would aim off the nose. But you're flying like this. So you're flying oh. sideways. And, and I'm telling you right now, you ask any guy that was a fact and he's going to tell you fly sideways. And you never, you never, never, never flew straight and level. Never. You were bobbing and weaving and doing this and, and anything you could think of to, uh, to, to not expose yourself for too long. If you were taking ground fire, for instance, and you were low guy on, down on the trees, the absolute worst thing you could do is try to climb out of it. It's stupid because you pull the nose up. Now you've exposed the whole back of the airplane or your belly. You're in a climb, so you're going slower. And as you climb up, your rate of closure is diminishing so that now you're sort of hanging up there. So mm. no thanks. No, I, I'm, I'm staying right down. I'm dragging my wheels through the canopy. And when you got down that low and your wheels were down in the canopy, you never used aileron in a turn. Never. You always used rudder and you made a pedal turn because you didn't want to put your wingtip down and catch a branch. Uh, so and and nobody nobody told you that in flight school. I mean, how high? I mean, what's the how high? What's the lowest? I mean, were you picking roots and and leaves and stuff out of the aircraft when you get home? It, it depends upon it depends upon whether or not you got too damn close to a rocket you fired <laughs> and all that crap started coming up. Um, how low is too low? There was no such thing as too low. Too low is when a guy throws a rock at you, <laughs> which which he did. <laughs> wow, oh, you you did get a rock thrown. Yeah, in the in the in um, the play trap valley, in the, I thought it was. I mean, the guy was he had to be really pissed off. Oh yeah, <laughs> I did. yeah to take a chance with a rock. He yeah, had a lot to of be. ammunition or something, but yeah, he's he's yeah. He threw a rocket. Oh, well. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, um, <laughs> this one uh, kind of was dealing with what you uh, were dealing or speaking about with uh, being mentioned over the radio, but uh, this is still a, a interesting. Uh, were the Soviets providing radar and signal intelligence assistance to the North Vietnamese in your AO? I, I don't know, Anthony. I don't know. Um, I, uh, not that I'm aware of, but I could never say that, that the answer there is no. Um, I think that what, what everybody needs to bear in mind is that our missions were, were very, very specific and, and our war in its, its scale was very small. And so I mean, I had nobody to answer to but me, or if Bucky was in the back seat, or another guy was in the back seat. But, but essentially, just me flying a photo mission. Um, I wasn't responsible for anybody else. Uh, and um, I think that I, I think that what we all did was we really compartmentalized, and we were able to to multitask, but really compartmentalize. This is the mission. This is what I'm concentrating on. And I don't want anything to detract from that concentration because that distraction could kill me. But I don't, I'm not aware of anything like that only because nobody, I mean, there were no fighters. Nobody fired missiles at us. I, I don't know. You know, I, I, I think that they, they moved and positioned their guns the same way we did with a visual reconnaissance. I, I, I'm that. That's the best I can do with that. Wow. Yeah, and Mr. Ray was saying, never fly straight and level, low, never, slow, never, and never, reliable. Never, never, never. <laughs> wow. I mean that, that y'all treetop flying. I mean, I, I'm always amazed hearing 
<laughs> hearing that, how low y'all got. Um, I've got an interesting picture, and I'll bring it up, and I won't know. We'll see if uh, you can mention it, but I imagine this one is going to be in the book, and if that's the case, I've got okay. another good photo that you can speak about. But um, this one uh, is about a POW that you encountered or may have captured. Uh, can you speak about that? Or are you going to save that for the book? <laughs> well, it's it, this, this is not being able to hit the broadside of a barn if I was standing next to it. And the, the, the story in the book goes into much greater detail. This was written by my company commander, Arlie Deaton. It's not accurate. It isn't mm -hmm. what happened, but Arlie, Arlie could, what's funny about this story is that Arlie couldn't say, that we actually pointed a gun out the window at this guy and he he surrendered. He wanted to say that we threw smoke grenades at him and he surrendered. Well, why would you surrender to a smoke grenade? But I don't know what Arlie was afraid of, but at any rate, the, the story is much more involved and it's it the outcome was the same. I mean, we did get the guy, but, uh, and I, I kind of think we might've been the only two guys to actually capture myself and Bob Jackson. The only two guys to actually capture a guy who was on the ground, but um, uh, that's <laughs> that's about all I. That's I that's per absolutely. We need to we need to have some surprises. Uh, and like you said, I love this. Uh, the captain, sensing the reluctance of the VC to climb aboard his aircraft, made a low, slow pass and began dropping smoke grenades, which persuaded <laughs> the enemy soldier to accept the offered ride. Uh, uh, that, that that that's wonderful i love that he's got and of course you know he, he of course he'll uh, he'll surrender behind smoke grenades so gotta drop the smoke grenades on him so ray carl just typed in here that he had actually done the same thing and i was not aware of that so oh mr you know, ray's got a book what mr yeah. ray t type the name of your book and i'll uh I'll get it promoted on here as well. We're going to try and get Mr. Frank on here. I, I would love to have Mr. Frank on here as well. Um, wow. That, yeah. Red said a uh, little creative writing. <laughs> I like well, that. <laughs> well, Arlie was, I, Arlie was one of the best people I've ever known. He was my company commander and Arlie and I stayed in contact. We talked to each other once every week or two for the rest of his life. I used wow. to call him, I used to call him on um, uh, on my computer from Korea when I was teaching in Korea and I'd call Arlie and talk to him. Um, I just loved him. I loved him. I I do anything for him. He sounds like a heck of a guy, that's for sure. That's and I got to say this is actually one of my favorite photos of you and especially when I found out what you were doing. So this, you know, this was really fun. The, the little gongs there are, they were all different sizes and the uh, Montagnards that worked for the CIA would play these and they would play music with them. And this day we, we, we got our butts wiped in, in volleyball playing these guys. And then they dragged out this, these urns of rice wine. And we, I, I, I remember when they uncovered this stuff, it looked like a, a Texas blacktop on a hot day with the fumes coming up out of the jar. And you had to drink it. Be, they were dragging your butt up there to drink this stuff. And I'm almost positive that I had gotten alcohol poisoning from this. And I had a hangover for three days. I have, I, I, the next morning when I got up to go flying, I could count every rotation of that prop. And my head went kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Oh, I was just terrible. It's just never touched that stuff. Anyway, this was a lot of fun this day. Next to me, to going to my left as I'm looking at this, so it would be my right. That's Phil. Go the other way. That's okay. Phil Phillips right there. He's the guy that that did the uh, International Bird Dog Association. Um, okay. I just And I'm going to see Phil uh, in July. The guy in the sports shirt is Gary Lowry um, there. And there's a guy without a shirt on back there. And um, he's the worst person in the world. Oh, wow. Okay. And don't don't uh, even go to play. I don't even want to see him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, can I ask? Was he uh, special forces or? or oh no, what, what? no, 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 no. Him. Nobody. He was. No. Uh, he Ooh. was unfortunately. He was. He was part of us. Ah, okay. Part of I us. gotcha. I gotcha. Well, I hate to hear that. <laughs> you hated it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have no idea. And this is a uh, another. Uh, oh, hang on! Before I share this photo, um, guys. Um, Cat Killer 3-2, an Army pilot flying for the Marines in the Vietnam War, is Mr. Ray's book. And um, I will be, I'm about to look that up and get the hyperlink on Amazon and put that in the chat, guys. So, I, actually, it's weird that this is happening. I just added that to my cart on Amazon uh, a few days ago on a Vietnam site. Mr. Ray, that is very strange that that happened. Um but this is another great photo. This is another group, uh, a group shot of you guys. And sadly, some of the faces are cut off. I think I. Well, that's, that's Bob Traver, half his head back there. That's me. And this is John Pappas. And John uh, was my platoon leader the last month in country. And I was flying for the, the uh, first platoon in, in, back in Holloway. Uh, John was a West Point graduate, graduated in 66. Um, if he, he looks like a cherub, if you saw him close up, he looks, he looks like an angel. He was without a doubt, the best officer I've ever worked for. And, wow. and if they, if, if, if you had to say, how would you, what would you want in a, in an officer, this unlikely guy from New Jersey, uh, was all of that he was all of that and uh they i uh, i just i loved him and and i i told you the story of the, the bullseye out in safeco field in seattle with ken griffey jr and it said hit it here jr well that was pappas with the birds with the bullseye on the side of his airplane he was a bullet magnet and uh, every time we went flying we got all kinds of stuff went on so there's a whole chapter on john and uh, I'm in Great. contact with his wife. John passed away in oh. 2013 from, from uh, I, I think it was pancreatic cancer. Um, mm. But uh, he was a lawyer. Um, he was uh, uh, a businessman. He ran his, his family restaurant. He was, uh, I, I, when we, Kate and I went up to West Point for his funeral, and it was the first time that I had cried. Uh, and and I think that 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 was, I believe, when John gave me permission to talk about what we'd done, and that's when I started writing. Was at after his funeral. This this is one of the best people on the face of the earth. That, that's uh, I remember when you first got me uh, shared this photo with me, and I that one immediately stuck got stuck out at one that all of y'all together and B how obviously happy i hate uh the, the photos chopped because the other two men are uh have just as big a smile uh, as you and uh mr Pappas do it's uh clearly y'all are uh happy and having a good time at the at the at this occasion and i hate hearing he's passed uh that's just terrible um i had uh before sorry look guys let me get to one more good photo um and especially since Mr. Frank's wife is watching. I thought she would get a kick out of this. Um, the back of your head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> at the back of my head. I like uh, that. Kath Kathy's clown. Yeah, I'm looking at the back of the back of the airplane. So, anyway. Oh, yeah. And I... Did, I know Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I don't think, uh, yeah, the AR is not uh, uh, bungee to the side there. So I hadn't actually gotten in yet. But that's anyway. such a great photo. But just curious, who uh, was this? Is a, a SOG man taking a photo or, uh, or actually, that was guys? first. That's when I, I uh, had been up there. Uh, at, I was at Holloway and, uh, and inadvertently and not realizing it began to work for. Um, CCS in uh, and those guys were all down in uh, in Bammy to it 
but they would stage out of a place called Duco. And I had no idea that I was getting involved in that. And uh, nobody told me what I was doing. I just got sent out to fly this stuff, and that's what I did. And I, I couldn't ask any questions because nobody had talked to me. They just said, go there and do this. And I went there and I did this as a major. And his call sign was coming. I knew something was up. But, mm. but I wasn't going to find out what. Ooh. So, I, I mean, questions are, I, I guess everybody's intrigued watching. Um, so, I mean, in your, in your year of, uh, of flying, I, I, one thing before that gets in, did you ever, I noticed uh, speaking to some of the CCS men, they actually had a, a few 219th guys uh, around, I believe 1970, uh, they they started helping out down south. Uh, did you by chance go, ever go down south, or were you strictly at Contoum working? I, I started out working for those guys at a Holloway uh, CCS, and they were oh. the, they were down in Bammy to it. Um, the 180, 185th was down in um, in in Bammy to it as well. That was a, the pterodactyls. That was a bird dog company. But <clears throat> they weren't involved in it yet. When they were disbanded, they became part of the 219th. Um, when I returned from uh, Contum, my last uh, month in country, uh, I, I, I was surprised. I, I didn't think I was going to be doing any more uh, over-the-border stuff. And the next thing you know, that's all I was doing. And I was working for CCS. Later on, uh, after I got out of the Army and I was... Um, commuting from Seattle to Salt Lake City to fly 767 with Delta. We had a commuter apartment. There was a guy there named Jeff Lugar. And Jeff and I went to breakfast one morning, and we happened to go to a Vietnamese restaurant and had some chicken soup foga for breakfast. And I asked Jeff, I said, what, what were you doing in Vietnam? What, what were you flying? He said, well, I flew for the 219th. I said, you did not. And he said, yes, I did. I said, well, you so come to find out he was there after me. And he worked for CCS, and his picture is in, in uh, uh, Plaster's big uh, coffee table book. Of, okay. Of Spag, and they have the little little tiny blurb on on Spaff, and that's uh, that Jeff's picture is there. So uh, with, I've, uh, I've got it back there. If yeah. I had a copy, I'd bring yeah, it. But yeah, most everybody right. everybody knows the uh, the. The uh, what you call it? Were y'all's uh, call sign or the CCS uh, two nineteenth guys? Was was their call sign Snoopy? You said or no? They were they were all those guys were headhunter. Still the head only guys. The only guys who were staffs were the guys who flew strictly for CCC, and that was us. CCC were the only ones who had their own little air force. Air force. Wow. That's uh, that's one of the more interesting parts, and originally how I found out about it from Tom Muscovich and, um, uh, of course, I'm going to forget his name now, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Pete Johnson. Um, oh, Pete, yeah. And 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 uh, hearing about it through them, and was like, holy moly! I uh, and of course, finally meeting and hearing about you through uh, Bucky, uh, just just blew my mind. <laughs> um. Guys, do y'all have any more questions? I know if we've kind of we've got a great number of viewers, uh, and I know some of we've got to save for the book. Um, did I skip any up here? Hang on, guys. I'm sorry. Um, ah, I did. I'm sorry, Jason. Gosh, I mentioned something at the start about Frank and Vietnamese orphans. You might have missed it, bud. I'd love to hear about it. Um, that's that's okay. Okay, that's okay. Uh, okay. I, I, that part was originally a, a standalone essay. Um, I did include it in the book because it, it, I thought it was really important. Um, mm -hmm. But I got involved with the Vietnamese orphanage. Uh, all I had to do was write some letters, and my mother took over, uh, and we filled up a deuce and a half with stuff, and another three quarter ton truck with stuff, and some money, and we took it to the orphanage. Um, the the nun there was magnificent, and her name was Sister Angela. And I have a Christmas card that she sent me. I still have it. Um, she spoke no English, and I spoke no Vietnamese. But we 
we managed to communicate. And I spent a lot of time over there in the last month that I was in Da Nang. Uh, years later, and this is also in the book, but I'm going to tell you anyhow because it's really kind of cool. Um, we had a Vietnamese a flight attendant on an airplane from L.A. to uh, Cincinnati. And it was an all-night flight. And after uh, the cabin service was finished, I excused myself from the cockpit. And I went to the back. And I spoke with her and asked her, told her I was a pilot in Vietnam and asked her where her family was from. And she said she had her m mother, father, and her sisters were all killed during Tet. Uh, she was delivered to an orphanage in Da Nang, and it was this orphanage. And uh, she was there, and I'm. she was a young girl then, and I know that I must have seen her. And I and and so I think that this is one of those instances where the world is that small. And I thought that was very cool. And that, that um, thank you for sharing that. I know uh, that that's some some stuff for the book, but uh, that that is moving. And uh, th Jason, I'm sorry I missed that. That was a really really good question. Wow. Uh, and and to further on that. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe you can correct me, but I think was there either a, a, a orphanage or was it a leprosyum down uh, down at the at Contum? I, I I think there was a leprosarium, but I I I don't I did not become in contact with that. Um, the uh, w when when we work for CCC as as the year started. And probably beginning the, uh, the toward the end of February into March, um, things really became very intense. And we flew from before the sun came up until it was after dark, and we were landing in the dark, and the mess hall was not open when we left, and it wasn't open when we got back. So we were we were figuring things out for ourselves. We did okay, and uh, we just we had enough beer, so we we're going to be all right. And uh, but it it so so what I'm saying is that, that we flew all day, and so there was not a lot of contact with anyone. And so it, mostly I talked to Phil and Doug, and sometimes Phil talked to me, and sometimes Doug talked to me. But that that was pretty much it. That's that's who I saw, and uh, that and. You know, hope we just kept our fingers crossed that the showers were turned on. But uh, that's uh, wow. Uh, some of the guys uh, with with you doing uh, the saw guys all uh, not all of them, but there was a large number of the contum guys. Uh, one of the officers in in particular, uh, Jim Kinstry of RT Alabama, um, who later went into the S4, I believe, but he got really involved with uh, either the orphanage or the leprosy, uh, the leprosyum. Uh, and yep, there was a leprosyum, uh, Terry said, and an orphanage. Okay, so uh, I'm getting one of them crossed, but I think he may have helped out with both of them. And what I was going to say was a lot of the SOG guys helped out with the orphanages and the leprosyums and would, would do what they could uh, to help out uh, another soft side of these hardcore warriors that you don't hear about <laughs> yeah, we were we were the bad guys weren't we <laughs> that that sometimes you like get to portray that but i, I like to show y'all softer side every now and again um good question saigon rocks have you been back to vietnam i'm curious about the experience no 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 i uh i asked when i was teaching in korea i had to take a uh, an orientation flight once every six months as part of my uh, qualifications as an instructor with the Korean FAA. And uh, they did, Asiana did fly to uh, to uh, Hanoi and they flew to uh, Ho Chi Minh City. And I asked if I could go on one and they they said no. <laughs> oh, well. Did, did they happen to know, did they just say no, or did they know your, any of your Vietnam history or anything? Or I, I think no? they may have known that I was a, a Vietnam pilot. I'd been in Vietnam, but but uh, no, um, it didn't. I don't think it ever entered into the discussion. It was uh, mostly a, a financially driven 
Um, so that was that was that. I didn't get to go. Uh, would I mean what uh, would you have liked to, or would you still ever like to uh, attempt to go, or is that just? Well, I you know I I would not attempt to go, and I, I'm completely honest with you. I would not attempt to go. I I I was in Vietnam. I I spent uh, almost nine years in uh, in uh, South Korea, uh, in and out of Japan. Uh, spent some time in China teaching, uh, not very long, but a little while in Hong Kong. Uh, and I've I've about run out of Orient. Um, I'm very content to go to the south of France. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm right there with you. I I wouldn't mind uh, getting in on the south of France trip as well. Um, <laughs> we've uh, we've gone almost uh, an hour and forty five minutes. I've got one good photo that uh, that'll be a nice little closer, uh, but that you can speak about before you uh, give the final rundown. But this is uh, another favorite of mine. I believe you said this was uh, your last day and night in Vietnam, you, the baseball game and your famous going away party. That was fun. We had a, we had a seat there out of, a, out of a wrecked bird dog, which is the one I'm sitting in there. And in here, the, the one with the shot glass up is a, a, a glass of, uh, or a shot glass of flaming uh, scotch, I think. And I didn't uh, pour it on my face and burn my eyelashes off. And the baseball game was great fun. And uh, I wasn't, I wasn't bad at baseball. So I, 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 I really enjoyed that game. I, I think I went three for three and uh, hey. drove in a, a run or two, much to the chagrin of Arlie Deaton, who was rooting against me. But that's the way it goes. But that was fun. That was my last day. And it, and Arlie, um, we flew down to Quinion, and uh, I I left Arlie at Quinion, and uh, I um, I saluted him, and he saluted me, and then he grabbed my hand, and then I hugged him. And he kissed me on the cheek and I kissed him back. And I told him I loved him. And I got in the airplane because I had to keep going. I had to keep walking or I wouldn't leave. Wow. I mean, uh, and that is what a what a great way to spend your last day getting to play with your brothers and and, uh, and having a dang good day uh, on the field, nonetheless, too. And then uh, a nice uh, going away party. That uh, That's, that, that's it was, wonderful. It was great fun. Um, since uh, we've uh, covered a lot of really interesting stuff, and we've got some of uh, some 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 book stories that I didn't think we'd hear, but we did, and I thank you for sharing those. Um, is there anything else that you would uh, I like to thank, share? I want to thank you for the I want to thank you for the, the for the platform, and and I and I really truly appreciate it. This is uh, nobody knows about us, and 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 now some people do. And that's and that's important, you know. Um, and to be able to share that and talk about the history of it, I think is important. And I thank you very much, Bud. I thank you. And I've I already know we're gonna have to have you back once the book releases and everybody gets a chance to read it. So if your schedule will be open uh, after the end of the year and the beginning of the new year, when people have a chance to read it, we would absolutely love to have you back to, uh, anytime, to discuss any, it. I am, I am delighted and honored anytime. That's, that's wonderful. Cause I've, I've already uh, gotten some messages and all that. So, um, and also Mr. Ray, thank you for, for contributing. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely going to want to get in touch with you as well. Um, and I'm glad your, your wife was able to join us and watch today as well. Already people saying thank you. It was a pleasure to hear you. Uh, everyone, thank you. Yep. Thank you guys for watching. Um, thank and you. Li yeah. Li and like I said, sir, we're going to definitely want to have you back. And um, I will just stay in touch with you. And uh, I'm sure I'll get some some messages to maybe try and reach out to you or say thank you and, and stuff like that. So I will definitely pass them along. But uh, if you've got nothing else, we'll uh, close it out for the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, and I thank you, sir. My pleasure. My pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. See y'all later. All you have to do is, uh, that, yep, okay, wow. See y'all later. Y'all have a good day. Um, guys, this was wonderful. I'm, uh, w w this was absolute treat getting to have, uh, have Mr. Frank on. Like he said, not many people know it at all about the 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 uh, the two nineteenth, and I would, uh, if you're 
wanting to learn as much as you can before you actually have someone who has written a book and who served and who knows their history. Um, you can get a little bit of their history. Well, not a, you can get some of their actions and exploits in the definitive history of CCC, Uncommon Valor. And you can also read about a little bit of their experiences at CCS that Mr. Frank spoke about at the end. Uh, call and Colonel Lindsay's definitive CCS history called Secret Green Beret Commandos in Cambodia. It is uh, wonderful. It's got listings where you can look up all the men and they're, where they're mentioned. And it's got a nice info uh, on their exploits at CCS. And Mr. Frank has actually had a story written about him in the book that I had one of my stories published in known as Pucker Factor. Uh, these are stories by the veterans, from the veterans, in their own words, straight to us. And Mr. Frank is pictured here. And by the way, this is volume one, issue one. Um, and Mr. Frank is right here, as you can see. And he gives a, a brief description on Ford Drum. And it's going to be a lot more. His his book is already, I literally ordered it the day he put the link out. Um, but if you're wanting to learn a little bit about Mr. Frank and a little bit about uh, the SPAF guys, um, those are going to be your three uh, best bets right now until um, December when his book comes out. But I've got the link in the uh in the uh, in the chat, and it will be linked to the show notes in the bottom. Uh, and guys, I cannot thank y'all enough. It has been an absolute pleasure today. We've still got a big week ahead of us, but you know what a way to start the week with Mr. Frank. Um, and as y'all heard, he's going to join us after we read the book and have some good questions after all of his crazy missions. Uh, I can't wait for that to start the new year with him. So you guys have a wonderful day. I'll be in touch with y'all later on to get ready for the rest of the week, but, uh, just enjoy this day. And, uh, we had a good show today. So thank y'all. And I will be in touch with y'all later.